wanted to spend just a few more minutes talking about where we are here in Massachusetts and what our options are to try and bring this issue forward. Right now, we are leading the nation with 19 bills to address man-made radiation. And there are many people in this room who have worked very hard to, to get bills written. So if you leave us with your email addresses, we will give you notice when those bills are coming up for public hearing. But don't wait. Reach out now to your state senators, to your state representatives, and say, please, let's get these things moving and moving fast. We also have four fact sheets drafted by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Dr. Deborah Davis was um, very gracious to come here in Mass to Massachusetts with Frank Clegg and other experts in 2015. They met with the Department of Public Health. Uh, they were just getting funding back after their budgets were cut at 9-11, so they needed time to staff back up. In 2016, I was getting anxious because we were about to start yet another school year with our children sitting in microwave radiation. So I offered my tech writing skill set to the Department of Public Health and helped them to write a fact sheet, and it was about four pages. We went through a couple review cycles, and then they thought, this is pretty good. Now we're going to take it and put it into a series of four fact sheets, one for cell phones, one for cell towers, one for Wi-Fi, and one for high-voltage power lines. That was in 2016, and we thought we would have that out quickly, three months, he thought. It's now been two and a half years. So I don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but we have a sheet somewhere, or I'll send it out to you if I have your email address here, that lists who at the DPH should we be talking to about this. And I'd like to thank Keith Marciniak, who brought me into North Middlesex Regional School District. We educated as superintendent, the IT director, the school committee chairwoman, and then they offered to let us speak to school committee. And God love Keith. He's been going like every two weeks for the last two years, presenting new information and every time they sit there looking like deer in the headlights. So Keith went and dug around on the Department of Education website and discovered that our districts are being held accountable from the state level for implementing all this technology. And so he put me in touch with Kenneth Clow, who is the Office of Digital Learning Director in Instructional Technology. And Keith and Kenneth Clow and I had a lovely conversation just last week about this. He's in touch with Commissioner Riley, and they are very much aware of this. Uh, Keith is going to be testifying tomorrow morning at the Department of Education's monthly board meeting. That is something that everybody in this room can do. You can sign up to speak and give public comment because they need to hear from more than just me and Keith and Ruth Wren, who did it last month. Um, so. At the Massachusetts Department of Public, I'm sorry, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they have a monthly board meeting, and you just need to reach out on their website and say, I would like time to speak. You generally have three minutes at the beginning of a public health or a public meeting to offer your comment. Um, so back when we were developing these, the Worcester School Committee had us in, and with great thanks to the people like Leslie, who's with us tonight, and Lance, and others from Worcester who have been critical in educating uh, the teams out in Worcester, both at the town level and the schools level. And at the point where we came in to educate there, Dr. Bob Knorr, who was the uh, director in the Bureau of Epidemiology in the Department of Environmental Health at the DPH, he actually sent them a list of things people can do as precautionary measures, and that's what that link will go to there. Um, and then the Department of Public Utilities. Some of you living in this area may know that National Grid has been piloting a smart grid program out there, which means without your informed consent, they come and they replace your old analog electric meter and replace it with a device that pulses microwave radiation at you and your loved ones all around the clock. That pilot is questionable. The Attorney General's office is investigating for cost overruns. Patricia Burke, with us tonight, has just been a champion in tracking all of the fraudulent activity around that. She's now working down in Rhode Island, trying to support people in New York, where National Grid is spinning that Massachusetts pilot went so great, so now we're going to do it in your state, too. <laughs> So uh, we had the privilege of presenting to the Department of Public Utilities last fall, 
and we said, how much time do we have? And they said, oh, we got the room for three hours. So we actually got to really, truly educate. I covered a lot of the materials that we heard here tonight, and Patricia drilled way down into that fraudulent pilot study. So, And Jan Johnson, who I know is here with us tonight, too, also came in and testified. Jan is a special education teacher, and she told us point blank what this technology is doing to our kids, and it's not good. Um, so the Attorney General's office, we had two assistant Attorney Generals at the Department of Ut Public Utilities hearing. So they're, they're getting informed on this. I actually chatted with Maura Healy at the State House one day. She put me in touch with her Chief of Staff. So they're hearing this, but when they first heard it, all they knew about was economic impact. They had no idea they were health risks. So the biggest lesson I've learned on this whole journey is don't go it alone. Get those around you educated and don't expect somebody else to fix this for you because oftentimes our public servants are serving the public. They're not public leaders. So we have to tell them what needs we need to have served. If we don't use our voice, nothing's going to change. So we have uh, contact sheets over here for you to take. And, you know, as we've discussed tonight, measure your exposures. It, this, this isn't rocket science. We can actually get a device that will show us what our microwave radiation emissions are. And here in my town of Ashland, I actually got a grant to put one of these on loan in our public library. This device is about $400. If there was no radio frequency in here, we just hear a little crackle confirming it's working. If it just lights up at green at the bottom, that's where the science is still discovering what the biological effects are. When it goes into yellow, that's where those symptoms of electrosensitivity might start creeping in. Headaches, nosebleeds, nausea, not sleeping, anxiety, depression, gut issues, all sorts of fun things. In red, we literally have thousands of studies all over the world showing this is biologically harmful. So even though most of us have turned off our wireless devices, we're sitting here under wireless access points. And you see it jumps up and down. That's the pulses. That's the peak exposure. So don't let anybody tell you, well, oh, yeah, the average is OK, because it's those peaks that are breaking our cells. All right? So um, measure. Go into your schools. Measure what you've got. And then you can take a router and plug an Ethernet cable into it, right? Plug it in on the back of the router. Then just plug your device in on the other end of the wire. Go into your settings and turn off all those antennas. And some people say, yeah, but the iPad and the Macs, everything's gotten so skinny, you can't really plug it into an Ethernet anymore. But you can. So this is the Gigabit, the Thunderbolt to Gigabit Ethernet adapter. I don't know, 20 bucks or something online. This will hardwire my daughter's MacBook. We figured out how to hardwire her cell phone. She uses an iPhone. It's the Lightning to RJ45 Ethernet LAN network adapter. So when she's home from college and she's home, we just got a little splitter so you can plug both things in at once. Then you just plug it into your device, go into those settings, and turn all the radiation off. So when I first did this with my daughter, she was about 15 at the time and kind of probably tired of hearing mom talk about this stuff. Um, so I said, just plug it in and see if it works. And she goes, oh my gosh, it's so much faster, <laughs> right? So she's excited. And then I could see the wheels turn and she said, so if I'm running my connection through the ethernet cable and I've turned off all those antennas, does that mean it's not eating into my data plan? <laughs> and I said, yes, because if she goes over budget, we make her pay, right? <laughs> so... That's how I sold a teenager on this, right? Yeah. So, but there are other things. There's something called a pluggable. Some of the Android and, you know, Chromebooks and stuff, you can hardwire with this too. But you do need to look at the pluggables online. Con uh, customers have written in to say, yeah, it works on mine, but there's, it doesn't accommodate it in this operating system. So before you buy it, make sure it's compatible. Um, so then once you've hardwired everything, Measure again, because there's sneaky little antennas all over the place. Um, my printer, I thought I had everything off. And I was sitting there in my home office one day going, OK, I slept great last night. I ate a good, clean, organic diet. 
why do I feel like the earth is sucking me down again after an hour or two of sitting in my office? And so I pulled out my meter, turned it on, and it was my printer. Although the little light wasn't on the front, it turns out there were two antennas inside my printer. So I just had to go into settings and go off, off. So it is important to measure, to make sure you're really getting all this stuff. Um, and, you know, as we've discussed, it's just going to be like big tobacco all over again, which it kind of already is. But as we go towards solutions, we may need a transition period. You can't go from where we are today to hardwired tomorrow. So what can we do to reduce it? You can put your devices on timers, right, with multiple settings. So if somebody needs to have it on for a short period of the day, it can do that. You can put kill switches in. You can have electricians put in light switches. Um, and as Frank Clegg was indicating, you can reduce power consumption in the networks. And I'd like to give a shout out to Peter Sullivan of Clearlight, Clearlight Ventures. He has worked with the Palo Alto School District out in California. And they figured out, like Frank was saying, the industry gives us everything full tilt all the time. Boom, 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 boom. You can take that down 90% and still have connectivity without all of that all the time. You can talk to your manufacturers, encourage our schools to be telling the manufacturers, we need sleep mode. That thing shouldn't be pulsing if nobody's trying to make a handshake with it, right? In Europe, they have decked cordless phones. Remember, we all had wired phones at home at once. Then they got replaced by these digital electronic cordless telephones, the decked. Well, mine was sitting on my nightstand, pulsing all night long, and I wondered why I wasn't sleeping so great. Um, but in Europe, they already have cordless phones that only pulse when a call is in play. We should have that technology here. In Palo Alto, um, they discovered that they didn't really need to have the 5 gigahertz band that was now coming in with all their new network equipment. The 2.4 was all they were using, so why is that thing pulsing? They also discovered that there were Bluetooth antennas on and the iPads that they weren't even using. Um, and then they had brought in a new system, and when they tested, they realized the old system was still going too. So we just need to get smart about this and work with our schools to transition through and then eventually get to hardwired. Another important piece of this conversation, first, let's get the radiation out. But the industry has sold us that we need to have all this technology for the 21st century classroom for our kids to succeed. Well, the science shows us that is not how children properly learn. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommendations that children under three should have no screen time at all, right? And how many parents, you know, need to get something done so they just hand their kid a pacifier in the form of a screen? And then the New York Times has done some great reports lately, and actually there was a new one that came out today, a new article. But the gist of it is, is that, oh, today's one was called Human Contact is Now a Luxury Good, <laughs> right? Screens used to be for the elite. Now avoiding them is a status symbol. Go figure on that. But as far as our schools go, back in October, uh, Nellie Bowles did a series of articles. The first one was the digital gap between rich and poor kids is not what we expected. America's public schools are still promoting devices with screens, even offering digital-only preschools. So go park your baby in front of a screen and leave them there. The rich are banning screens from class altogether. A dark consensus about screens and kids begins to emerge in Silicon Valley, right? Somebody quoted in there saying, I'm convinced the devil lives in our phones. And here, Silicon Valley nannies are phone police for kids. Child care contracts now demand that nannies hide phones, tablets, computers, and TVs from their charges. So what does Silicon Valley know that our schools haven't caught on to just yet? And then... Uh, if you have a child who you've given a device to, and when you take that device away and the kid loses it, there is a very likely chance that that child is developing digital addiction. And that's not just a term that we banter around. The studies are showing that this uh, microwave radiation, as well as excessive screen time, are hitting the same receptors in the brain where we see alcohol, drugs, tobacco, pornography, gambling. So we need to be very judicious about 
what we are exposing our kids to. Dr. Victoria Dunkley is a child psychologist. She's written the book, Reset Your Child's Brain. She's got a four-week protocol where, as intimidating as it sounds at the outset, the first week you educate everybody around your child and say, we're going to do a detox. And then you have to actively parent again and plan what your children are going to be doing for the next three weeks and make it fun. And as you know, it sounds like a really scary challenge, but I'll tell you what, at the end of those, the kids are better, the family is better, and now you've got the ability to say, no, this is not ruining our lives or running our lives anymore. It's up to us as the parents. Dr. Katherine Steiner Adair wrote The Big Disconnect about parenting children in the digital age, and she's gone chapter by chapter through the different phases of childhood development from the wee little ones all the way up through high school and what technology is doing to us. Both of these books are very well resourced with scientific literature. So just know, as you raise this conversation and as you're scratching your head going, I think I'm seeing some of this in my own house or with my, friend, my daughter's best friend, or there are resources already here to help us get through this. So next steps, you have to educate because nobody knows this exists, except for the 70 or 80 of us here in this room tonight. You're all to be congratulated for getting here on a busy night. None of us ever expected we'd have to make room for this issue in our lives, so to have a standing room only crowd is really just kudos to all of you. So start the conversations with those around you, then go to your schools. You don't want to go it alone. You'll be too easily swept under the rug. Educate those around you. I've had the privilege of helping to build a nonprofit out of the UK where we have distilled the science, the risks, what other countries are doing, and medical best practices into a half hour course that anybody can take. Take it yourself, get your loved ones to take it, and then sit down around the table and say, okay, well, this is crazy. What's the first thing we might do? Maybe tonight we turn everything off and get a good night's sleep. Um, and we, there's just a small fee because we are a nonprofit. We still have operating costs, but we have bulk rates available. We will work with your schools to get this training in there and to get our children protected. The award-winning film Generation Zapped, um, I know a number of you have seen it and a number of you have actually hosted it. Um, and I will come in. If you can talk to your library and ask for a screening, they'll pay for the licensing typically and may give me a stipend or something to come in for my time as well. Um, but it's 74 minutes with an award-winning filmmaker. Dr. Herbert's in it. Dr. Carpenter's in it. Um, Theodora's founder of the Environmental Health Trust is in it. So it's really, really well done. So bring me in. I'm local. I'm in Ashland, and I would be honored to come help educate your schools, your community, your libraries. We are getting really close to where they're going to come kick us out of this room. Um, so I apologize that we won't be able to do the question and answer session. That said, if you have burning questions, please write them on the index cards, leave them with us, and we'll find answers, and we'll post those too. Okay. All right, thank you.